It is indeed a blessing and privilege to have this opportunity of coming together uh, with those of like precious faith to attend unto the word of God for a little while and I trust offer up prayer in the house of prayer to the glory of the Lord and to avail ourselves um, of his hand set before us. What a wonderful blessing it is to have the beauty of the gospel church in our lives that we can close out the things of the world for a little while and truly center our thoughts and attentions upon the things of the Lord. Appreciate uh, very much the question that Brother Matt asked me this morning, um, very thought-provoking and stirring um, of mind. It, it also is exactly and completely parallel to that which I have endeavored to study in preparation for this morning and in the question that came forth it caused me to reflect upon the great blessing that we have of the mercy of God in our lives when we stop and consider and ask the question as the psalmist David did um, how can man be just with God that's a very important question that every one of us should continually ask ourselves that we would have a reflection and a reminder of our dependence upon the Lord, who is our justification, our redemption, our reconciliation. He is the atonement. He's the expiation. He's uh, the way, the truth, the life. He's our priest and our king. He is the apostle and high priest of our profession. And aren't we thankful, I trust this morning, to have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother? that we can go to in the darkest hour of life. And not only will he be there that he might listen, but he's, he stands at the ready to offer that which we stand in need of. And he's qualified, uniquely qualified, as the captain of our salvation, that we would understand and, and that by his mercy and by his grace bestowed upon us in our lives, that he is able to secure us because he's walked the path before us. We've been endeavoring to look at, for a number of weeks now, the differences, if you will, but most readily the similarities and uh, the likenesses of the uh, triumphant kingdom, the invisible kingdom, being defined as the elect family of God, and the militant kingdom, the visible kingdom that is here in the world today. And that we would understand that we stand so richly blessed Certainly to be a part of the invisible kingdom. Wouldn't you agree that by God's grace and through the unction of the Spirit, you have a witness within your very heart and your soul where you might uh, sing with uh, the loudest that you can, I know my Redeemer liveth. And I'll see Him. I'll see Him when time is no more. I'll see Him when I leave this time world and enter into glory land. I'll see Him face to face. You can't proclaim that outside of grace. But what a great blessing that is. And then also a great blessing that we have <clears throat> to be a recipient of God's outstretched hand, his merciful hand uh, before us that we can occupy here in the visible kingdom, which uh, if it is the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is founded upon the rock of ages, Christ his very self. What a great blessing that is. And the militant church, the visible kingdom, should, as we have said, should manifest outwardly in our experience those very things and highlight the very attributes of Christ uh, that are clearly marked out in the invisible kingdom. They are, uh, they are uh, different from one another, but they are the same, if you will, in the eyes of God. Oh, church, I would have you to understand it is a great blessing to live our lives in service unto the Lord. It is God's will that all of his people would do that same thing. He seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I don't know why, by God's mercy, I came into the proximity of, uh, of the church, but I did, and I'm thankful for that. And I want to I serve the Lord all the days of my life that I might be able to grow in grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and have joy unspeakable and full of glory right here in this time world as I sojourn in this life on my way home to glory land. That's the abundant life. 
And Christ said, I come that they might have life, and he is life, there's no life outside of him, but that they might have it more abundantly. Now this morning, I've got a lesson, a, a place in scripture that <clears throat> probably could preach on for weeks, and maybe we will, I don't know. But you pray this morning that the Lord would bless us to consider it and to look upon it in the context that we have been looking at things relative to uh, the, the attributes of Christ that the invisible kingdom clearly portrays and illustrates and how those things align here in the visible church. It'll do us good if by God's mercy we're able to connect those things. If you have your Bibles and want to turn with me, go to the book of Colossians. This is the epistle of Paul to the church at Colossae. And we're going to begin in the first chapter. <clears throat> I'm going to read this to you, and uh, God willing, I'm going to set the, the attributes of Christ before you that you might consider looking at these things uh, on your own. We are certainly not going to be able to cover all of them uh, this morning um, and do any of them real justice, but uh, I want to set them before you um, in order that, uh, that you would be inclined, I trust, uh, to search these things for yourself. Um, you know, sometimes in dealing with the Apostle Paul, you have to either jump in the middle of a sentence or go way, way, way back in order to start uh, the thought. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, let's, let's begin reading in the, in the ninth verse. Uh, to set the context, Paul says, for this cause we also, to set that context before you, Paul is looking to the faith that has been manifest by the church at Colossae. They have manifested their faith. Uh, their faith was visible by their behavior. And I will tell you this morning, if your faith is not visible to those around you based upon uh, your behavior, then there's something wrong with your perception of your faith. James said, uh, show me uh, your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead. So our faith this morning uh, should be visible to ourselves and to those around us. And Paul is, is calling that out uh, in the experience of this church. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, and all wisdom, and spiritual understanding. I'll tell you, you want your pastor praying for the church that he pastors just that way. Uh, that God's people that are in the church are growing in grace and knowledge. Uh, that the Lord is blessing them uh, and enlightening uh, uh, their eye of of understanding and their heart of understanding uh, through their diligence of their application of the things that God blesses the ministry to set forward. Uh, that's how we grow in grace and knowledge. That's building a building. You don't just uh, gather materials and set them off to the side and then all of a sudden uh, hope that somebody comes along and builds the building. You got to get the materials, you got to use the tools, and you got to build the building. And Paul is saying, my prayer for this church is that your spiritual understanding uh, would increase. I'm thankful for your exercise of faith. Uh, and in so doing, it positions you uh, to grow in grace uh, and knowledge uh, of His will uh, in your life. There's nothing better than going forward in your life, a uh, feeling in your heart and soul that you're doing what the Lord has told you to do. Oh, I wish I could say that all the time. I didn't hardly even do what my parents told me to do like I should have, let alone my Father which is in glory. Uh, that's why I love the communion service so much because uh, we are outwardly manifesting that which Christ commanded that we would do. And we're doing it like He did it. We're exactly where He told us to be, doing exactly what He told us to do. How often can you say that? Uh, it should be our heart's desire to align with the will of God uh, in that uh, perspective. And remember that God's will is not constraining, it's liberating, if it's truly the will of God. He says <clears throat> that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now he's brought up the increasing in knowledge a second time. Listen to this. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. I would have us all this morning take a little inventory. 
Um, how do you feel about suffering alongside of somebody uh, in your life and in your experience? Is that something that you look at and you say, you know, I did the, I really did. I lined up. I, I suffered alongside uh, with that person. And, and long suffering is not just enduring them until they, they change their mind. Long suffering is not uh, just enduring people's uh, uh, issues and problems uh, until they get on board with your way. That is not long suffering. Long suffering is, is getting alongside and having a mutual walk in the Lord. Now, you know what? Sometimes you get alongside and people won't walk with you. And, and you, you can't make them no matter what you do. But that's not the point of the matter. The point of the matter is, is that from an internal perspective, that we exhibit patience of that uh, in a joyful way. And that we exhibit long-suffering in a joyful way. And that's contrary to our nature, I'll tell you. It's contrary to my nature. Uh, when I get around people that aren't uh, walking in the same path, direction, and pace that I'm walking, I'm tending to look uh, somewhere else from a natural perspective. But God has given us the church in order that we can walk together, uh, united in faith as kindred in Christ, being long-suffering with one another. I'll tell you, if you're not long-suffering with me, uh, you're, you're going to be on a rough journey, a rough road, uh, because I'm a mess. Uh, we all are. We're, we're all a mess. So we need to suffer long with one another. And when we step back and we examine ourselves, uh, that Paul is saying here that through an exercise of faith, of, of faith and an increase in knowledge of, of the will of God, uh, that, uh, that should manifest itself uh, with a joyful dispensation as you exercise patience and long-suffering with those around about you. And I'll tell you what, you need grace to do that. You can't do that in and of yourself. He says, uh, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Oh, do you realize you've got an inheritance this morning? Now, we have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, uh, and fadeth not away in heaven and immortal glory. The Apostle Peter uh, speaks of that clearly. Uh, and, and it should work a lively hope uh, in our experience. We have an inheritance in heaven and immortal glory. And it should always be in the forefront of our mind. But as it is, we should also consider the inheritance that we have right here in this world. Do you know the church is an inheritance? The church is that which God has set before you uh, that because you are an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, uh, you have an inheritance uh, that you can start living off of uh, right here in this time world. It's a foretaste of glory divine. You know, we're, we're getting ready to retire. It's, it's on my mind. I mention it all the time. Uh, uh, forgive me. I'll get over it once I get out on the journey. Uh, but there are a lot of things that, that you think about and you talk to your financial advisor and you want to get everything all lined up and set uh, uh, in place. And there's, not, there's really not a whole lot of an exercise of faith in that conversation. I mean, you're trying to dot I's and cross T's. And with that, the question comes up, well, what, you know, how about the legacy piece? What do you want to leave behind? Well, I'll tell you, it causes you to stop and to think a little while. I would much rather use the bounty that God has blessed with, with those that I love, so I can use it with them while I'm here. When I'm gone, I'm gone. <laughs> I, it, it wouldn't bother me. My wife's not going to agree with this. She didn't when I said it first. So I'll say it again. It wouldn't bother me in the least bit if my last check bounced. <laughs> As they lay me in, it bounces. Now, I know that's not the right way to do things. Hopefully it wouldn't. But I trust you get the point. God blesses you with, with bounty in your life. All that you, we, we, we hear the term, give them their flowers now. What a blessing it is to, to take that which God has blessed you with and use it in his service with those that he has blessed you to have in your life. You know what that's called? The church. <laughs> that's the church. The living church, the militant kingdom. That's one of the purposes of it while we're here in this time world. That we can labor together and that we can... And look at the principle that's taught over in the book of Acts uh, where the apostles came unto uh, all of those members that were over there and those that weren't members. And uh, the, the, the admonition was, sell everything you got, put it in the, in the big pile for the disbursement amongst the people. You see, that's the right attitude. To dwell in the church. Jesus told that young rich ruler. He says, have you done this? Have you done this? I've done all of those things. I've kept the law to the entirety of it. Well, unfortunately, he was wrong about that. 
But the point that Jesus made with him, okay, one thing that thou lackest, sell all you have and give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. That was a disposition, a mindset that was of necessity. If, you're, if we are truly going to dwell together um, as the Lord intends uh, in the kingdom here, uh, in this time world, we've got to have that disposition and that mindset that we would look to the needs of one another greater than the needs of ourselves. And to understand that God has placed us um, as a, an heir of God, and that is our inheritance while we live here. I tell you, you look at the church, and you look out at the people that, that tend to make up that local body, and your heart longs for them. It longs for them. And if it doesn't long for them, you should step back, get on your knees in prayer, and pray unto the Lord that God give you wisdom and understanding of the inheritance that He has blessed you with in your life. Take it not for granted, but embrace it to its, its fullest. He says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom, His dear Son, in whom we have redemption uh, through His blood even the forgiveness of sins. Now I read all that and said all that took way too much time doing it to get to these next verses. And I want to set this before you that you might consider the attributes of Christ relative to the invisible kingdom and the visible kingdom and that God in His, in, by His mercy and by His grace would bless us to connect the dots on those things. That we might truly see uh, the inheritance that we have of being a member of the church that is established upon the rock of ages in our life. It is the most precious thing that you will ever be in possession of here in this time world. The most precious thing. You remember way back when we started this conversation, the words of, uh, of the Savior Himself. It is as a treasure hidden in a field that is so valuable that you sell everything you've got and you buy the whole field. Not just go out there and grab it, buy the whole field to be sure you get the treasure. It's a pearl of great price. And it's really not about the purchase price. It's about the value of it in your life. Is the church that to you this morning? Or is it something else? It's important to recognize the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ by the mercy and grace of God. Let's look at these next verses. I'm just going to read them to you. And I, I'm going to set before you what I believe to be the attribute of Christ. And then, uh, God willing, in a, little, uh, for a few moments, we'll consider a couple of them. Because we're only going to get a couple. He says, in whom, Christ, we have redemption, 14th verse, through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You could preach on that all day long, right there. The redemptive work of Christ and the, uh, the, the forgiveness that comes uh, through the redemptive work of Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. And, and you, can't, you can't add anything to it, take anything away from it. He says this, now watch. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. An attribute of Christ being the firstborn of every creature and all creation. God willing, we're going to dig into that one this morning. But that's an attribute of Christ that we might understand from an invisible perspective. It's of necessity that He is the firstborn of all creation and of every creature. He's first in order and in rank. And, and Paul deals with it in another word here in a, a couple of minutes, and he uses the, the terminology preeminence over all things. That's the first in rank. That's the first in order. That's the first in influence. If Christ is not first in line as it pertains to rank in your life, to order in your life, to influence in your life, then you've got, you've got the balance out, outside of where it's supposed to be. He's, he's got to be first in those things. He says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. Christ is creator God. 
Creator God. That is a, a, a biblical d- a doctrine of that uh, a Satan and the world would love to undermine, has tried to do it repeatedly by trying to disrupt the lineage of Christ, trying to call in question the eternal sonship of Christ. A cr- a Christ is uh, the Word, the, the spoken Word of God. He's the creating agent in the Godhead. He's Creator God. Certainly he created the invisible kingdom. He created the visible kingdom as well. Listen to what he says. Uh, for, all, by all, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. What else is there? Visible and invisible. What else is there? Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. By him and for him. Again, there's a lot of preaching in that. I don't know that we'll get to that this morning, but I want to set before you that, uh, that he not only is the firstborn of every creature, uh, but he's also the creating agent of the Godhead. He says, uh, and he is uh, before all things, and by him all things consist. That's speaking of, of uh, if, you know, if you're going to create something, you have to precede the creation. Does that make sense? If you don't exist... How are you going to create anything? Creation um, is exclusive to God. Man says, well, I created this, I created that. Man hadn't created anything. Man takes that which already exists and forms it and, and puts it in a particular order. And if you put it in the order that God intended of uh, uh, the use of that that he created, um, it's profitable and it prospers. It works. When man gets his own idea, thinks that he can take that which already exists and do it his own way, he makes a mess. Every time. If if man creates anything, which he doesn't, it would be the mess. (laughs) But understand that Christ being the creator, this verse speaks to the eternal presence and sonship of Jesus Christ. Before all things, he He exists. We, you can go over to the book of Genesis. You can go over to John, uh, the gospel according to John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was, uh, was with God in the beginning. All things were created by Him, and without Him there was nothing created. That covers it, doesn't it? He's the creating agent. And, and he, had to, he had to exist in order for creation to come forth. The principle of creation... Is taught in the book of the gospel according to John uh, that uh, that light came out of darkness. You know, there was nothing in that darkness that contributed uh, to the light that came out of it. Nothing. No attribute of that darkness that contributed at all uh, to uh, the creation of light. And it's certainly not a coincidence that John also says that Jesus Christ is that light. He is that light. So Christ, an attribute of Christ is that he is, he's the creating agent of the Godhead and he's the eternal son of God. The eternal son of God. I'll tell you, that's an important doctrine uh, that uh, a lot of people get a little squirrely with. Uh, the, the term eternal sonship is not in scripture, but the principle is taught uh, throughout scripture. He is the eternal son of God. He did not become the son of God when he was born of the virgin. That was a manifestation of that uh, which already existed uh, in the Godhead. By the way, that's the same way that natural birth works. (laughs) That life exists before it comes forth. That's that's not for nothing. (laughs) You you can just have that one. That proves beyond a shadow of a doubt where life begins. He says this, before him, and, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. That's an attribute of Christ. He's the head of the body. Scripture is full of of word pictures uh, relative to to the church, whether it's invisible or visible. The the illustration is a body. We're all made, uh, we are in one body, and we're all parts in particular of that body. You cannot say uh, to the hand or the finger, uh, uh, to to the leg, I have no need of thee. I'll tell you, we live every day. And when you hurt yourself, uh, when and sometimes, you know, a little paper cut or something that seemingly is not a big deal, um, it just, it lays you out. The body works in harmony with itself. And you can't, uh, you can't elevate one uh, particular part above another part of the body. You know, that's a, that's a biblical principle. God is not a respecter of persons. 
When he looks at the elect family of God, he looks at them through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and there is nothing that ascends unto him higher than the blood of Jesus Christ, and uh, we are in Christ, uh, and Christ is in us. So when he looks at us, he doesn't see a me as being a, a big sinner requiring more of the blood than Brother Bill, um, and therefore he gives favor to Brother Bill. That's not the way that it works. He looks and he sees the blood. And he doesn't see you as a forgiven sinner. He sees you as righteous before him. That, that is mind-boggling to me. How can man be just with God? Only through and by the work of Jesus Christ. And, and him being our, the propitiation, him being the mercy seat, him being the covering over uh, that the all-seeing eye of God uh, looks upon instead of looking upon uh, the law and my inability to keep the law. He looks at Christ. Christ is the head of the body. You don't have a head, you don't have a body. It is that simple. The head sets things in order in the body. You know, the, the great medical frontier um, in, in existence today is the, is the brain. It's, it's mapped out. I mean, there's constant work trying to understand it more and more and more and more. And, and who knows what, what uh, God will bless man to, to understand as time uh, goes on. But what we do know is that the, the head, that which, which puts things in order, is of great value and necessity for the functioning of the body. Your heart doesn't beat with, without the, the proper order being in place. Christ is the head of the body. He says here, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Again, he says, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Christ is the firstborn of the dead. That seems like interesting language, doesn't it? Firstborn, you, your, your mind says firstborn, that's life. That's talking about life. Well, it is talking about life. But Christ is the firstborn of the dead in that, yes, He died upon the cross of Calvary, uh, but He rose again, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, never to die again. Never to die again. And He's the only one, by the way, that has done that or that will ever do that. Church, understand, we, we are blessed uh, to understand that Christ is the head of the body. We've talked uh, last week uh, about the, the cornerstone and the foundation and uh, the, the line upon line and the, and the plummet and, and all of those things that, that Christ is the foundation uh, uh, for us to build upon. And indeed, we have a sure foundation. But I would also have you to understand He's the capstone of the matter. He's the head of the church. He is at the highest pinnacle as it relates to the family of God and all that we would leave him there. One of the biggest problems that man has is they're trying to, uh, to bring Christ down to them as they try to uh, elevate uh, unto Christ. That's not a new problem, by the way. There was a time when, uh, when uh, the, the necessity was, uh, or the, the desire was to build a, a, a temple or a tabernacle to ascend unto heaven. And boy, I'll tell you, God's people set out to do it. And they got it going up. God intervened and, and baffled their language so they couldn't function and couldn't communicate and all of those things. But understand this morning that when we are blessed of the Lord to leave Christ in that high and lofty position uh, that He, uh, by uh, His inheritance, occupies, when we're blessed to do that, things fall in order in our lives. One of the biggest problems that we have so much of the time is we get things out of whack. We get them out of order and we serve a God of order this morning. And if we'll stay on track with His order, uh, things flow as they should flow in our lives. He says, He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have uh, the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him uh, should all the fullness dwell. Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Bodily. What a blessing that is, that, that God came where we are. 
and set uh, his, uh, his will and, um, and his commandments uh, in the example of how it is to fulfill those commandments uh, in the person of Jesus Christ right here before us. You say, well, I don't know what to do. Look to the person of Christ and he has shown you what to do, how to handle the matter at hand, um, how to always give honor, praise and glory uh, unto the Father, how to pray, how to be forgiving of one another, um, how to hold up uh, uh, the, your, your God uh, in your life and ascend unto him uh, uh, by his mercy and grace. Uh, Christ has set it all before us. We're not left to wonder. What should I do? How should I construct my service unto the Lord? How should I construct my uh, 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 God in my life? How should I build my, uh, my building of discipleship? You're not, uh, you're not uh, burdened down and imprisoned with having to figure that out on your own. You've got the person of Jesus Christ. Because in Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I'll tell you the other thing you want to know, and that says it a little bit later in, Col in Colossians, uh, uh, that in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead body. There was no room for anything else in the person of Christ. He was all the way full. And then something's full, it's full. You take some, a little drop away, it's, it's no longer full. You add something to it, now it's overflowing. Christ, uh, he, is, he is the way, the truth, the life. He's our priest, our king. He is the potentate, if you will. There is none that can uh, ascend higher uh, than Him. He is surely the fullness of the Godhead. Going on, he says in the 20th verse, And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether they be uh, things in earth or things in heaven. Christ is our reconciliation. Christ is that one who takes the ledger. And as we endeavor to look at the facts and equate it to a balanced ledger, whether it pertains to um, our home in heaven and immortal glory, uh, that we would find ourselves resting in the grace of God, recognizing that in the person of Jesus Christ, um, He removed uh, the, uh, the debt of sin uh, for the elect family of God. He took it out of the way and took it away from us as far as the east is from the west. You'll never, you will, if you start heading out east, you'll never head west. It's, you'll, it's that far away from you because of Christ being your reconciliation. He took that ledger and he balanced it through his shed blood from an eternal perspective. Well, guess what? He does the same thing in his militant church. He walks among the candlesticks. He reconciles what is right and what is wrong. He sets things in order in, in our experience. And if we will just hold to that, that he sets an order... We'll have fellowship with him in that. He's our reconciliation. He goes on and he says, um, and in the body of his flesh, uh, uh, and you that were sometime, in 21st verse, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind uh, by wicked works, uh, yet now he hath uh, reconciled. And in the 22nd verse, it says, in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. You know what Christ is? He's our atonement. He is our at one with God. He is that one that we uh, look to by the doctrine of representation that brings us at one with God. How can man be just with God? There is no other way other than the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can be uh, uh, just with God. He, he is our atonement. And I'll tell you, we now have the atonement to, uh, by experience in our lives when through the unction of the Spirit we are blessed to feel at one with God. Lastly, 23rd verse. He says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. You know what Christ also is? He is the author, and he is the finisher of our faith. He is the one that brings it into existence. And he is the one who defines it to its finest detail. When Paul says that if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, are we satisfied this morning that Christ is indeed the author and the finisher of our faith? Are we satisfied this morning? 
Or do we need to define our faith uh, uh, differently than Paul does in the Roman letter uh, when he says, unto every man is given the measure of faith. Therefore, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You see, there, there are uh, so many of God's people out in the world today that are under the misconception that you can behave in a certain way and thereby procure faith uh, in your life uh, and in so doing uh, come into a relationship with God. And if that is true, it's no wonder why people that are out in the world that believe that, uh, that teaching, uh, that they take credit for some part of that process. And God is never going to share His glory with anybody. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. The love that you have in your heart for God and the love that you have in your heart for one another is a fruit of the Spirit. You didn't just decide to love. You say, well, I can't remember a time when I didn't love. Well, bless your heart. That's good. Neither, neither could John the Baptist. <laughs> he, he leaped for joy in his mother's womb. He was born of the Spirit of God while he was yet, uh, uh, when he had not yet become manifest and being born uh, into this time world. I can't remember a time when I, when I didn't love the Lord. Thank God for that. That is, that is something that we should rejoice in. You say, well, you know, I really would like to pinpoint the thing. I mean, people ask me all the time, when were you born in the Spirit of God? When, when did you receive the new birth? And I can't answer it. That bothers me. I'll tell you, church, understand uh, there are blessings that God has given unto us uh, that, that we should embrace and, and not fall prey uh, to man's devices in trying to construct something other than the order in which God has set in place. Even if you lived your life in such a way that you could remember a time, you had no use for God. You had no use for his peace. You had no use for his grace. You had no use for the love. It was just me, myself, and I. And, and that created all the committee that I needed. If, and you could feel like that was my existence. You know, the, the Apostle Paul uh, struggled in, in a lot of ways with that kind of a mindset. Um, and he aligned himself uh, with activity uh, that fed that in him. God dealt with him, turned his world all the way upside down. <laughs> all the way upside down. And even though we can go to Scripture uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter 9, I believe it is, and you can see the experience of the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road, and we can look at that and say, uh, surely uh, that is a, an illustration of one uh, that is born of the Spirit of God. Even though we can look at that event and say that is how, uh, that's how we glean from it, or that's what we believe about it, um, and, and, if, and if you don't, that's okay, uh, but that's, that's what I believe that God has given us as a, a word picture of, of the contrast that exists. But even if we can do that, we cannot pinpoint the moment and the second and the instant that the Spirit of God uh, came unto that brother and quickened him into divine life. You see, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You cannot tell from which it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit of God. We look at the trees blowing in the wind and we can say, surely the wind is there. Can you, can you uh, clearly say uh, when it started? Can you clearly say which way it came from? Can you clearly say which way it's going? Certainly you cannot. So the point uh, that, that I set before you in this is that Christ being the author and the finisher of our faith, it speaks to the reality and to the fact uh, that, uh, that we must look to Him for all blessing in our life. There, there are so many attributes that Christ portrays uh, in, uh, as it relates to the, the invisible kingdom and, and as they relate to the, the visible kingdom. This morning, with the time remaining, I want to just look at, at one of them because I think it drives home the, the point of, of the, the similarities, if you will, of the invisible and, and the visible kingdom. Back up in the 15th verse, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now in the Hebrew letter, the Apostle Paul, um, I believe he wrote the Hebrew letter, um, he says it this way, and I want to just get this thought before we go over to the book of Psalms, and we'll make our point relative to this firstborn, um, and, and that's the only one we'll deal with this morning. In Hebrews chapter 1, Paul says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners uh, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That was the manner in which God spoke unto his people uh, uh, was in type and in shadow and through the prophets. He says, hath in these last days 
spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Listen to this. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Paul says back in the Colossian letter, uh, who is the image? Christ is the image um, of the invisible God, of the firstborn of every creature. Christ is the express image of God the Father. And in so, and in the fact that he is that, the things that he did and the things that he said um, and the things that he manifests uh, before God's people, all creation, him being the firstborn of all creation, he set the very person and will of God before his people. Isn't that amazing? That Christ condescended to this low estate. That God, the God of all grace in his wisdom, and in his mercy, condescended into the realm of creation in order that his people could see clearly his love for them. See clearly. Don't you just love it when someone loves you to the uttermost? Don't you just love it when someone manifests their love for you in a way that just knocks your socks off? That just like, it, it, it's just so so amazing and so overwhelming and it causes you to, to just elevate and increase in, in love and it works a, a, an experience in your life where it's, it's truly unspeakable. You can't, you can't define it. And believe me, it doesn't have to be a big expensive gift and things like that. Sometimes, uh, and it happens so much of the time uh, with the little children because they approach uh, the relationship they have uh, uh, for a while in their lives uh, uh, completely undetained and without agenda for the most part. Um, and uh, and they, they're, they're, they're more uh, sincere, if you will. Uh, they, I mean, they're going to be truthful with you. They're going to tell you the truth. Now, we have to teach them to do it in the right way, but they're going to tell you the truth. And then when one of them behaves in such a way that just manifests a deep, heartfelt love for you, not because you've given them something, just because they love you, I'll tell you, it, it absolutely just it sets you back in, a, in the best way. It stops you. And you consider the blessing at the hand of God of the love that He has given unto you in your experience. That doesn't even remotely compare to the love of God. Doesn't even remote. You know, you're going to see love face to face one day. You're going to see it face to face. Can't wait for that day. <coughs> I've seen it here in my life. You know, sadly, a lot of times we see love set before us as we bid farewell to someone. Instead of seeing it as we bid them come. <laughs> we, we get it backwards in our experience. I'll tell you, there's coming a day when you're going to be face to face with that love. And, and it is going to define you. It's going to define you as an heir of grace, as a child of the king. Christ is the express image of God the Father. He is the icon that we can click, that the full program will set itself before us. Because he's the firstborn of every creature. Let's go to Psalms. We're going to go there, and we'll only go there this morning um, and, and set this thought before you. Psalms 89. <clears throat> In Psalms 89, we find the, the psalmist David praising God for his care uh, for the church. And I trust this morning that that would be our desire as well, that we would praise God for his care for his, his church and the blessings that we have of being a part of it. I want to begin reading, and I want, you to, I want us to pay attention to the language that is being set forward here. 
And I'll, I will point it out, I trust, but perhaps uh, the Spirit will point it out to you uh, even, even before. But let's just read, let's start in the, the 11th verse of the 89th Psalm. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. Those are large mountains. Thou hast a mighty arm. Strong is thy hand. And high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. That kind of sounds familiar to another verse in Psalms, doesn't it? I, I trust this, at this point we are seeing clearly who is under consideration here. Would you, would you agree that this is talking about our, our Lord and our Savior, uh, the, uh, the creating agent of the Godhead, Jesus Christ? Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength. And in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense. And the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou speakest in vision to the Holy One. Now David is getting ready to make a change. It's evident he's been talking about the person of Jesus Christ. His creating power. The things that he has created. Even to the finite point of, of Mount uh, Timar and uh, Mount Hermon. He is the creating agent of the Godhead. People ask you, well, how, um, how did this get created? I'll tell you, creation uh, manifests clearly the handiwork of God uh, through the person of Jesus Christ. You can go over to the book of Genesis and the first chapter and you find there uh, that, the, uh, that things happen when the word, uh, the person, the second person of the Godhead says, let. Let. I'll tell you, <laughs> the power that Christ displayed in creation just simply by um, a, a, a pronouncing of the, uh, the, the ability for that which uh, was aligned to his creative will come forth by saying, let. Let there be light. And light sprung out of darkness. With no help or assistance from the darkness, it was created. And all things that came forward, uh, you find in Genesis, and I would encourage you to, to go back and read that. We don't read that like we should. Because then also, you see a God of order, uh, that all of the things that God did create, um, even the animals and the things in the sea, and all of those things, He brought them into existence and then commanded them that they would bring fruit after their own kind. What came first, the chicken or the egg? I haven't heard that all my life. Well, obviously the chicken, because God created the chicken and then told the chicken, have eggs, lay eggs, and there'll be more chickens. That's creation. It came by the power of God in simply speaking it into existence. Now watch what David does with this. This is who he has been talking about. Watch how he transitions this. Then thou speakest in vision to thy holy one and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Well, Christ was not chosen out of the people to occupy his lofty state. He's talking about himself, David, being the king, the appointed of God. Christ, uh, Christ descended, if you will, from a, uh, his descendants came from the seed of David. And there is such a beautiful picture about the kingdom uh, that David was appointed to um, as it pertains to us functioning in the visible kingdom here in this time world and the, uh, the synergy and the similarity and the continuity of the eternal and invisible kingdom. Listen to the language. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. Have I anointed him? 
When, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of the wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, in his right hand, uh, in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the right of my salvation and I will also I will make uh, him Emma, my firstborn higher uh, than the kings of the earth now Christ is the firstborn but I'll tell you you have an inheritance as being defined if you will in the firstborn you have an inheritance in heaven and immortal glory being in the firstborn and you have an inheritance right here because you've been anointed by God. You're an heir of God. In order that you would be able to enjoy the riches of His mercy and His grace in His kingdom while you live here in this time world. You find safety. You find security. You find God's providential watch care in His hand uh, upon you. you. You find God fighting our battles in our experience. And yet, so much of the time, we have a tendency of wanting to, to step into uh, our, our function as an heir of God, uh, embracing this inheritance uh, in a way not recognizing that we are as, as dependent upon God uh, in the church here today as we are dependent upon God to get to glory land. We must need seek His face in all things that we do. And there's never a time when it's safe to do anything else. I will, make him high, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. I tell you, the, the church is going to be here when Jesus comes back. Going to be here. I'd like to be right here. I truly would. I, I, it would be wonderful if it is. Because that means that there are people of God that are endeavoring to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And God will prosper that. If that is our motive, if that is our desire, and we don't forget our first love. Did you know that if the church at Ephesus had not uh, fallen prey, uh, they repented at one time, but they obviously fell back into error. Jesus told them, unless you repent, uh, you've forgotten your first love, and unless you repent, I will come and I'll take the candlestick away. I'll remove it. Did you go over and read all those seven churches of Asia? I submit to you that if they had repented and remained penitent and had kept Christ as their first love and followed the example and the order that he set in his kingdom, why in the world would they not yet be in the world today? What we find ourselves doing much of the time is instead of getting on board with the Savior, we try to convince him to get on board with us. And it's a recipe for trouble and despair and ultimately disaster in our lives. Psalmist David closes this. He says, If they break my statutes, well, if, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I, will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. We don't have to look very far to see David's experience. He got himself in a condition because of the sin that he committed that ultimately came to the point of consigning to the, the murder of Uriah. That that we would understand that God judged that and chastened him. He got to a condition that he lost the joy of the salvation that he was in possession of. He didn't lose the salvation. And church, I'll tell you this morning, when you fall under the chastening rod of God, even though it's grievous at the time, Oh, that God would bless us all in patience and in long suffering to look to the deliverance of the Lord, recognizing he loves you enough to chasten you. And when he does, 
then you lean closer unto him because it only endure it only endureth for a little while that you would come out on the other side of it rejoicing in the mercy and the grace and the love of your heavenly father recognizing he's prom- he's he's made covenant with you and he is a covenant keeping god He's made a covenant with you that you will live with him in glory. And he's made a covenant with his people that his kingdom will be here in this time world uh, when Christ comes the second time without sin unto salvation. And I want it to be here. I want it to be where, where God's people whom I love in my life have that place to come and where Christ is walking among the candlestick. God bless you is my prayer. I trust we've said something this morning that would stir your, your pure mind. And that God would add his grace to the preaching of his word. <clears throat> Publish an open door to the church this morning. If there's one here that has a desire to unite with the church, we would encourage you to come forward um, as we sing a hymn. And then we will go kind of immediately into conference. Uh, Lord of Lord. Does someone have a selection? 60? Let's stand and sing number 60. And the doors of the church are open. Number 60. Jesus, my Lord, my Savior.